Knife Radio's Kalalo presents Just Another Look. Just Another Look is an innovative, exciting, albeit decidedly provocative, and yes, yes, certainly controversial, socio-political analysis of issues of a local, regional, and international nature. Just Another Look is heard on Nice Radio on Saturdays at 6 p.m., which repeat broadcasts on Sundays at 9 p.m. You can catch us on the World Wide Web, www.niceradio.info. You can also check us out on Facebook and YouTube. I am, of course, Keith Joseph. Today, dear friends, is Saturday. It is the 28th day of September 20. 24. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of your favorite program, Just Another Look. In our previous edition of Just Another Look, first aired on Saturday the 21st of September 2024, we addressed the issue of young people getting involved in Vincentian politics. And one is not quite sure at precisely what's the point that some people make when young people do get involved in our politics. Because time and again, leaders point to the fact that there is a need for young people to be encouraged to get into politics. It is important that in political parties, you try to ensure that there is a blend of experience with age, with maturity, but with youthfulness. And many have pointed to the significant change that took place in Grenada not so long ago when the long-established NNP led by Keith Mitchell was booted out of office by a group of young politicians. But over the last several months, The government, the youthful government, has received some flack from members of the public because they've been forced to make some significant changes and some say it's been good because they're standing firm on principle and corruption, etc., etc. But on the ground, there are straws in the wind. There are concerns being raised. But that happens in every society. It is not necessarily because they are young. It is because they're involved in politics. And the politics of the Caribbean has been characterized by patronage. By making the electorate believe that you are there to provide them with gifts from time to time. We have on this program before criticized these clinics that ministers have. They're not doctors, but they have clinics. They have constituency clinics. They have clinics at their offices. And more often than not, the clinics are about having members of the electorate come to their offices, express their commitment to the political party in charge, and expect in return some sort of largesse. It is that you want to get a job. It is that you want to be able to get some financing. 
It is that you want to be able to be more readily identified with the party because that is a way of getting something from them. And so when you look at our Lives to Live program, each time stock or stocks of, of galvanized lumber, cement, and steel arrive, quote-unquote, for the Life to Live program, you hear radio stations being inundated with calls as to who has been the recipient. How have the spoils been shared? And invariably, the complaint, rightly or wrongly, is about the political bias shown to those who are supportive of the ruling regime. You may recall that several years ago, relief assistance went to constituency offices. If you needed assistance, you needed to call or go to the constituency office. To put your name down and to be in line to receive some assistance. And there was some measure of concern that yet again people were calling and saying that there was a distinctive political bias in the way things are done. So our political system operates essentially over the years, decade after decade, largely on the basis of political patronage. Trevor Monroe has written several times about how political patronage has been working in the Jamaican system to the detriment of national politics. And we say that largely because at the end of the day, those who benefit most are those who are clearly supportive of the ruling regime at the time. But the hope is that parties can sustain themselves and access governance more readily if they capture the youth vote. And some of them believe and adhere to the principle that to capture the youth vote, you have to bring youth. But you recognize in St. Vincent de Grenadine that the current Prime Minister who's been in office for 23 years has indicated that he is the youngest head. So for him, it appears not so much that you need young people physically, but you need young minds. And so he boasted at his own convention or at his own rally that he is the youngest head. He is the youngest head. And one can interpret that in many ways. But we can safely say that it appears as though he believes that he thinks like young people that he appeals to young people and he knows what to say to them and what to put on the table in order to win support. And that is the reason people were questioning what was the real rationale for Vibes Cartel being here after being officially released from prison because of the decision of the Privy Council. Was it to test the waters? Quite apart from what the Prime Minister say medically, which people are not quite sure about. Was it to test the waters as to how Vincentia Duke would respond to Vax Carter? Would it surprise anyone in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who follows Gonzalez's politics? That in the lead up to the next general election, we may see Vice Cartel coming to perform here. Yeah. 
would it surprise anyone? What was the real reason for Cartel being there? Because prior to that, I don't know any Vincentian other than the Prime Minister himself who has put on record this country's medical capacity with regard to the ailment and respond, treating the ailment of which we are told Vibes Cartel is afflicted. Where have we gotten that information before? Because if that is true, then we could have been advertising a sort of medical tourism saying that we have this fantastic medical team, individual and or team, that can treat an ailment better than perhaps any other country in the Caribbean. And so we may attract patients inflicted by that disease in droves. And now that we have more hotel stock that we're boasting about, we'll be able to accommodate them. But you only get it after the announcement that cartel is here and people start raising questions about it. But he is the youngest head. And we mentioned in the previous edition of Just Another Look that there was a time when he boasted of giving youth a chance, and he still does. Youth and women are given a chance. But are they really? Are they really? What levels of responsibilities are given to the youth who he claims to be bringing forward in Vincentian politics? Or what has happened to those who he brought forward? Because it appears sometimes that the Unity Labour Party engages in a sort of, of, of musical chairs with quote-unquote young politicians. So one is never quite certain as to how long any one of them will be allowed to stay within the system at a decision-making level with regard to Vincentian politics. Indeed, one is not even certain of the current crop of ministers, old or young, relative to their engagement in decision-making within the institution of which they are members. So that one looks at the way in which ULP governance is undertaken and recognize that that same approach to governance is what the country gets from a ULP government. And that is why the challenge has always been, whether you bring young people or you keep old people, the system of governance essentially remains prime ministerial dominance, something that Gonzales was critical of in the years of doing political economy and lecturing in different parts of the Caribbean and around the world. His own criticisms of the systems of governance at work in the Anglophone Caribbean were always very clear. And in his writings as a lecturer, was able to articulate several points that he thought needed to be changed. One of them was the right of recall of parliamentarians who are not deemed to be doing their work by the electorate. That the electorate would have right of recall. But we can hide behind the... The, the fact that we didn't get the constitution changed the way we wanted it in 2009, and hence you're not going to get that because we can't do it that way. But you don't need a constitutional change to put in effect 
constraints on the i manis leadership or the one manis leadership of government you don't need constitutional change for that you can by your own example engage in the beginnings of a consultative democracy you could do more by sharing around the responsibilities of government amongst your ministers but also amongst institutions that can be created to facilitate an enhancement of the democratic process but we're not seeing that And so it appears from our analysis of the way governor, governance is undertaken by Gonzales that the youths really do not have a place in the decision making process either in his party or in his government. Putting a young person in a position, but not giving them the decision-making powers, not allowing them to engage the relevant expertise to assist and guide them in their work, doesn't change the price of eggs. And so you have young people, in terms of chronological age, being named being highlighted, being awarded, but really ineffective in respect of decision-making that would advance the cause of Vincentians and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we're kind of playing with the public, we're playing with the electorate. It's a sort of political mamagism thing. But you continue as Prime Minister and as leader of your party to talk about common board. We are accommodative of young people. But young people may very well be seeing that that accommodation is purely a shelter. It is a hint, a suggestion that if you come on our side, you will do better. than if you were to go elsewhere. But it does not necessarily mean that there is fulfillment, professional fulfillment, that allows an individual to feel that he or she is making a meaningful contribution by sitting on that side of the table. More than anything else, it may well mean that if you come on our side, we will take care of you. And you will benefit from largesse, social and economic. That's what it may very well mean in the long run. But it is difficult to accept that when the opposition engages young people in a way that they may not have done before actually, That it is the ruling regime <laughs> that becomes most critical in casting remarks. But if you look at what the reaction has been from the leadership of the ruling regime, you recognize there's an element of fear. A feeling that the likes of Shallow and others who are moving into a different political space may combine with the established order to create a transformation, a transformative institution that may provide a different orientation 
an offer for the future of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It may lead to greater engagement in, of youth talking to the nation about their deliberate engagement and involvement in their decision-making process within a social institution, that is the political party that they have joined, with a mandate to effect change. Change not only at the level of the party itself, but at the level of what the party offers to the nation for its future. That is the fear that you see. So all this talk about light and stars and what's shining and what's not shining, etc., etc. The Prime Minister may very well be recognizing that the lights on his political career are being gradually dimmed. And that he is not the only show in town. He's not the only one that is articulate. He is not the only one that would appeal to young people because now you have young people who appeal to young people. And if he's not careful, he may very fi well find himself out of date because he has to be able to keep pace with the changing youths of the world. How is he able to appeal to them? Yes, we've recognized that you have attempted surround yourself with youth from time to time, with children, with students, etc., etc. And then, in the midst, he laughs more than them because he's laughing and he's looking at them to see if they're laughing at the same time that he's laughing at what he's laughing at and that they're not laughing at him. But the youths are now coming forward to join national politics. But they're doing so in a manner that allows them to feel comfortable that they will be able to effect decision-making within the institutions that they are joining. They're not there to benefit from political and economic largesse. What they want is to assist in the decision-making process that determines the future of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So if you listen to Shallow and his recent interviews, one gets a sense of a firmly rooted individual with an outstanding intellect Measured thinking. Paying due attention to every question and the implications of every question asked. And opting not to play political gimmickry with the responses. And that is the challenge that the youths who are now coming forward in Vincentian politics, the majority of whom seem to be lining up with the New Democratic Party, may well be doing so because of their perception that that institution may, at this particular historical juncture, be more willing to facilitate change within as well as without in order to more readily, more eagerly attract the nation's youth in support of political change in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
And so the initial response of the leadership of the Unity Labour Party is one of fear. Because the individual's decision to move in this or that party was not motivated by the parties clamoring to come here, come on this side, come on that side. But by the individual desire to make a contribution to the de- genuine contribution to the development of Vincentian society. So you look forward to how Dalo and other youths who are getting involved in national politics are able to utilize their educational foundation, their life's experiences to fashion a politics that is sufficiently appealing to the Vincentian electorate who are themselves seeking change. Seeking an alternative. And who may very well attract younger voters. Younger voters. To follow them. To be part of the political transformation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So of course. Over the past several years we have grown accustomed to political pickong as a strategy of the ruling regime of a calling of names but you notice over time that name calling has changed you're not hearing so much more about malignant and dishonest or minority wrongs or lowest common denominator or possessive of a sort of learned helplessness. Because increasingly with the Vincentian electorate has reached a stage where their message is very clear. Stop that nonsense. Be a mature politician. Deal with issues, not with personalities. And the Vincentian electorate in its maturation is also looking at the way in which the ruling regime deals with youth. There was once a promise to help in the reorganization of the National Youth Council. Instead, it died. It died. There's no talk of a National Youth Council anymore. There was also talk of an exciting prospect for the creation and sustainability of a National Student Council. That also hasn't gotten anywhere. So what you have left is the pump him up of the fact that if you pass four subjects or more, we give you five hundred dollars. That can even buy one book in some of the subject areas. Cannot even buy one book. But with a glib smile and a sense of patronage, we can have leadership kind of suggestion. <laughs> well, we give you a little something, you know. And yeah, yeah, that's how we appreciate you. Utter rubbish. It is an old time, old khaki pants style of politics. Wrapped as patronage. We have to end the patronage system as a nation if we want to progress. We have to facilitate genuine transformation such that youths 
are able to be involved. The youths themselves recognize that during the process of discussing constitutional reform in this country, that by the time the final document was completed, they had no input. And they were on the program, they were on the committee for several years. They were on the committee from inception. So the youth's experience in the constitutional reform process speaks volumes of the modus operandi of the leadership of the Unity Labour Party. The youths emerged from that experience believing that they were mere tokens to give the nation's youth the impression that you are represented, your voice is being heard. The youth represented told the nation representatives told the nation following the release of the proposed new constitution. None of our ideas have found their way in that document. So in a sense, while they were tokens, giving the youth of the nation the impression your voice will be heard and you are represented, they didn't even get token recognition of their ideas in the final document. So there were those who said that that was exactly what was going to happen in the long term. And it was unfortunate that the late Pyle Campbell, before he died, lamented the fact that after so much work had been undertaken, the Constitution was rejected by the nation. But that's what elections do, don't they? They are designed to facilitate the will of the people. And that's why people say you get the government you deserve because you vote them. You will get vexed if you didn't get what you thought you were going to get. And PR of all people should have known that. You don't always get what you think you want to get. Because at the end of the day, the political process is not all about you. And that's why we are always reminding people that you may fool all of the people all of the time. Or all of the people some of the time. And you may fool some of the people all of the time, but you don't fool all of the people all of the time. At some point, it catches up with you. So in the interest of the future of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are heartened by the likes of Shallow and others coming forward. And as youths, we expect them to become the leading lights of the future. Reaping the benefit of the experience of the elderly among them. Benefiting from the maturity of political experience of those around them. And being eager to learn the craft of politics. Enough to be able with time to provide the leadership that the country is seeking. New ideas, new ways of doing things, new approaches, genuine consultation, genuine engagement of the electorate, collective wisdom is always better than that of the individual. People react better to change when they are part of the process of change. So we need to pay more attention and encourage more of our people to serve the nation by becoming politicians. You cannot always sit on the fence 
and point an accusing finger indicating it's them it's them who have we sue that only happens in dictatorships full engagement of the electorate is what we need in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and our political institutions are lagging behind in terms of keeping pace with political trends globally we cannot allow to ourselves to be bogged down by our political history but to use that political history and our analysis of it to fashion a way forward that would facilitate the genuine transformation of how we do the business of politics and how we make development a national adventure not a political party initiative we speak a great deal about meritocracy but in practice not much of that happens there's too much political bias political prejudice and patronage our history of political mendicancy of moving forward forever on our knees begging our way through is not appealing to today's youth we need to move forward standing tall proud of who we are as a people and committed to the development of our people and our nation in tandem with our people the business of i and i and i and i ought to be laid to rest some political leaders need to begin to understand that there is something we call we us together until we make that transformation we'll be forever in the quagmire of the politics the decadent politics that is still characteristic of our nation but i want to move on to another issue that of what we choose to call road rage road rage accidents vehicular mishaps are all too commonplace now in St. Vincent and the Grenadines Friday evenings through to Sunday evenings we are at the point increasing number of accidents across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But it's not only weekends. And so one would have seen because everybody sends everything out as soon as it happened these days of three vans. <laughs> three vans colliding. And several people being injured. Three passenger vans with people on board. It is as if there is no control over our traffic system, particularly with regard to passenger vans. There was a time we were talking about 
noise abatement in the society generally. Then we started talking about noise in passenger buses. Just as there was a time when we were trying to control tint on vehicles. All of those appear to have been cast aside. And you wonder if, if the Ministry of Health has grown tired of trying to express to the people of this nation the impact of the incredibly loud music that are played on some of our commuter vehicles. So that you have to shout in order to indicate that you want to stop. It's difficult for a passenger to tell a driver you're being a little bit reckless because you get abused. And strangely enough, you get abused not only by the driver and the conductor, but by other passengers who find it is all right. It is only when people die by unnecessary accidents. Or people lose relatives and friends in vehicular accidents that they express some concern about the conduct of our drivers on the road. But the craze and the rage is not limited to passenger vans. The spate of these new small or these small vehicles that are coming in are wash in the country. We see them coming in in droves. And we're happy that people have their own capacity to commute or to go out with their family whenever they so desire. But there is a new spate of road rage that has come along with those vehicles. And in a small country like ours with hills, corners, in close proximity, we have seen many of those vehicles moving to the dung heap just as quickly as they have come into the country. Nobody seems to be in control. So during the past several days, we have witnessed the continuation of an aspect of Vincentian society that we have unfortunately committed to ignoring. We continue to ignore it and ignore it at our peril. So people are getting injured on a regular basis. People are losing limbs in accidents on a regular basis and people are dying in accidents. So in the recent weeks, we have heard of the three buses flashing. And then during this week, we were treated to an even more disturbing incident where a student, a student fell out of a moving passenger van. Because the door was left open while the vehicle was moving. Imagine you're sitting at home 
and you get a call that your son or daughter just fell out of a vehicle where they were pay they were a paying passenger and that somebody left the door open the van kept moving and your child fell out who is taking responsibility for that and so the police are boasting look we took away the license right away because the commissioner of police has that authority but there's a bigger problem the bigger issue is the general conduct of drivers and conductors of many 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 of our passenger vans Sometimes you wonder the way in which they overtake other vehicles whenever and wherever. The way in which you're never sure who's actually driving the vehicle because the conductor seems to be giving instructions from the other side of the car to the driver to the other side of the of the van to the driver who's on the other side. How is this how is this acceptable in our society? And what do our commuters say? You have rights. You are paying to be taken from point A to point B and that should be done safely. There's a contractual obligation for the person to take you where you are going and paying them to carry you safely. But as with so many other aspects of the ascension life, many of our people believe that they should maintain silence, say nothing, while you are being driven Fearful that you may not reach where you intended to go. And then we have others who are for the young crowd. So the passenger van then becomes a source of entertainment. For them it's the music it's the type of music it's the giddy headed nature of the drivers and conductors and their interaction with some of the students but what type of society are we building So there are some passenger vans that don't want any older people inside of them because they know that it will create a problem. And should some mature individual or self-respecting individual gets into a van and requests a toning down of the music or a change in the mode of driving, then that person becomes the object of scorn and derision within the vehicle. So that's the bigger problem. The bigger problem is that we are in a social malaise in which all the people are being forced to apologize for things that they have not even done because they are cowed into fear by many of our young people. How did we get here? 
And perhaps we need to understand that governance of a society places a great deal of responsibility on our leaders. But if our leaders fail to show good example, whatever you do becomes an example anyhow. And if they believe that your example is part of the reason that they are quote-unquote successful, then it becomes all the more important for them to follow. We have to understand the responsibility of leadership. And that's why we say to those who go into leadership positions that you ought to be aware that whether you like it or not, others may be looking at you for example. And we mentioned time and again the experience in Barbados. When Bajans expressed concern about Rihanna and her changed behavior. And they were questioning, is this really what we want? in terms of exemplary behavior. And her response was alleged to have been, she was alleged to have said, I did not ask to be anybody's role model. That is true. But very often, artists, leaders and whatever they do whether they like it or not may well be taken as examples of how to get where they got and that's why we have repeatedly expressed concern on this program that the loss of morality or the insistence by many that we now have a new morality which turns out to be the absence of any sort of morality that that does not help us as a society it instead leaves us in the lurch It leaves us as a pathetic lot. With nothing for generations to follow. As ennobling. Some people like to talk about the ennobling of our Caribbean civilization willy-nilly. But at the end of the day, they're not quite sure. What examples to use in respect of that ennobling? Because history, not the ones they write, but the ones written about them, may be saying something completely different. So it is interesting. That Eyewitness News was able to report the police, quote, have charged the driver of the van. This is where the child fell out of the van. With driving without a licensed conductor on board. One. Two. Driving in a manner dangerous to the public. Three. Permitting a conductor to ride elsewhere other than inside the vehicle. 
playing a musical instrument in a public place without written permission. Yeah. So we had that they tried him. But why is this a one-off business? Is this a one-off business? Why can't we get the rules right? Why can't we apply the rules right? Because we have a new generation of van drivers, of passenger van drivers. For whom safety appears not to be a priority. And what are the statistics about repeat offenders in respect of road accidents? What the statistics tell us? And how are we dealing with it? But there's another challenge before us. Are police officers themselves partly responsible for the road rage? How many police officers have procured passenger vans themselves that they have other people driving for them. And what level of control do they exhibit over those drivers? Is there a trend for police officers to purchase passenger vehicles? And have them worked by others. Why are we not asking people to be in uniform? There ought to be some sort of dress code. There are some countries in this ca ca Caribbean where the law, the traffic laws, insist that the conductor must be properly seated in the vehicle. Some bad drivers say that one passenger less, that's one dollar less or one a few dollars less. But they consider people's health. So it's not to have passengers with the bottom hanging out the door. Dress in appropriately and hanging over passengers who are on the way to work or wherever else they are heading. How much are we insistent on the application of the very rules that we have created for commuting in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? The police have significantly improved their communication with the Vincentian public over the last several months. And that's a good thing. And we welcome that. And we know that people, young people, young drivers, young conductors, are eager to make a dollar faster. But at what cost? And under what rules? If we're creating traffic rules, to protect the safety of commuters and the safety of those who use the nation road, then we ought to ensure that those measures are enforced. We need to be clear. Since is a problem, let's deal with it. Drivers and conductors not adhering to the rules, let's deal with it. Because the lives of Vincentians are precious. What if, God forbid, the child who fell out of the bus has lifelong health issues? Who is going to be paying for that? 
who is going to be paying for that? Are these not matters that have to be addressed and addressed on a regular basis, just as much as the police come with all other types of programs, to be able to showcase the examples of what ought not to be done, as well as what should be done. What are the criteria for allowing people to drive passenger vans? What are the criteria for conductors? And how are these monitored? So that we can have a sense of order in that aspect of Vincentia. We are heartened by the fact that eyewitness news says that the police say they would like to assure the public that they will continue to take quote unquote decisive and uncompromising action against anyone who flagrantly disregards the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Well, in this case, we're dealing with traffic laws. But like most other aspects of our life in Vincentian society, we are operating on the basis of ad hocratic principles. After the fact, we have all these fancy things to say. After the fact. And a statement from the police say, the safety of our citizens is paramount. And we are resolute in enforcing the law to its fullest extent. That comes after the fact. If we were applying the law as it ought to have been, we may never have had to reach this stage. We may never have had that callous disregard for human life that allowed an individual to be driving a vehicle while a door is open and a child fall out from it. The best part of the police comment is this. Quote, we urge the public to report any traffic violations or suspicious activity they may observe. By working together, we can promote a safer and more orderly nation. Excellent. Excellent. But make it work. And also make clear that persons who report traffic violations are not then victimized or are not then made victims of those whose inappropriate actions they have reported on. We have that responsibility. We have to make sure that that is possible. What we want to say in today's program, the Prime Minister usually goes to the United Nations General Assembly and makes an annual speech. The nation is told the date and time and how to find UN General Assembly's commentary or, or coverage when he's speaking. We have people from St. Vincent Grenadines and the Embassy abroad who will go and be part of his entourage. And he tries to make a keynote address each time he does. And then, many of our newspapers publish what he says. 
But perhaps not enough people listen to the content. But we do need to listen to it. And he spent, on this occasion, much time addressing the issue of small island developing states. And the challenges that they face. And that is admirable. Because as you know, there was a meeting of small island development states in Antigua and Barbuda not so long ago. The problems of small island developing states, Trevor Farrell, a lecturer at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine, Trinidad, for many years, often pondered whether or not these little rocks that pop up to and fro across the Caribbean whether they were meant to be inhabited. Because in many respects, they have spawned populations that are far too numerous to live comfortably at home. Were it not for emigration, many of our countries would not have survived. And that is our reality. But while he's making that case for greater attention to be paid to the broader international reality of small island developing states, within CARICOM, within this economic space, within the OECS, and even smaller economic space, What is the level of commitment of the leadership to bringing us to a state where we can be genuinely united? Putting our differences aside and stop trying to be crabs in a barrel and all work together. Caribbean people are bright people for the most part. And some have distinguished themselves at the international level. And perhaps Gonzalez may have wanted to be in that position at some point. But unfortunately, as you are aware, Mia Motley has attained an international stature in a rather short space of time compared to Gonzalez. But this Caribbean in which we live, this grouping of small island developing states, still operate on the basis and the premise that we have a greater Antilles and a lesser Antilles. And we continue to see decisions being made at the level of CARICOM that are not really implemented in a manner that allows for us to operate as a united group. And we keep pointing to the West Indies cricket team and the University of the West Indies as examples of what we can achieve together if we put our minds to it. But what we have not done in the process is examine the realities, analyze the realities of those two institutions. The West Indies cricket team and the University of the West Indies. Many a country has difficulty meeting its annual financial obligations to the University of the West Indies. But 
The West Indies cricket team every time there's a selection, there's fracker across the Caribbean. Who should have get picked because they're from this country? Who didn't get picked because they're from that country? Etc. Etc. It's the way in which people say about Trinidad and Tobago Carnival is a, a remarkable display of national unity. Only to discover on investigation that if you look at some of the bands really, you see clear delineation of class, of race, and of ethnicity. But they say, market it as a festival of unity. We too often fool ourselves in this Caribbean because we don't like being honest with each other. We prefer to leave people with fanciful concepts, nice sounding phrases, and words that befuddle the mind <laughs> rather than to sit down and realize that we are not authentic. We prefer the ease of being false, of being other than we are. And hence the challenge that we have of becoming who we can be and ought to be. That is our challenge. So we can go to the United Nations and make a lot of noise about what we require, what we want to see change. But if we're not willing to effect change at home, on the home front, if we are not willing as a region to put aside our differences and to think for goodness sake, we are about people, we are about building nations, then why are we going and ask others to help us? When it is about the I rather than the us, when we eagerly sweep our differences under the carpet to give an impression that I, the leader, has been able to achieve this. We remain lost. And what happens? The world holds aloft this or that individual from the Caribbean. So we have this or that Nobel laureate. This or that Commonwealth Secretary General. This or that of the United Nations, etc., etc. Individuals. And these individuals have not always been able to commit our people to understanding that their achievements are really our achievements. Because they were produced from within the bosom of our region. How can we leverage their achievements to enrich our peoples and enhance their understanding of what we can achieve as a collective? How the I can at one time be enriched and enhanced, but yet humble enough to be facilitated as a major catalyst for strengthening the we, the us. Enough said. You've been listening to another edition of Night nice Radio's Kalaloo presentation, Just Another Loop. Just Another Look is an innovative, exciting, albeit decidedly provocative, and yes, yes, certainly controversial, socio-political analysis of issues of a local, regional, and international nature. Just Another Look, heard on NICE Radio. First on Saturdays at 6 p.m., repeated on Sundays at 9 p.m. 
But hey, you can catch us on Facebook and YouTube. I am, of course, <laughs> Keith Joseph.